Hey, traders, this is Blake Morrow with Traders Summit. And with me today is Beat Newsbomber. How are you, Beat? How are you? Good to see you. Hi, Blake. Thanks very much. I'm very good. And are you self? I'm doing well. You know, we're on the eve of, um, of, of, of the Jackson Hole Symposium. And we've seen some volatility in the currency markets, which has been welcome. I, I mean, you know, you think about August, it's, it's actually quite exciting to see a little bit of volatility. I wanted to ask you, you know, what are your thoughts going into, um, into Jackson Hole? And is there anything else that you'd like to discuss that might be on your mind? Yeah, thanks very much. To be honest, uh, I just have to make a little sort of step back into a few weeks ago to sort of prepare a run up to Jackson Hole. So basically, as you remember, when we talked about last time, Davish Florida gone hawkish. That was really the first real big telegraph of the taper is a sort of, you know, rolling into town. We then obviously had strong and non-farm pales, blah, 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 blah. Uh, last week, we had the Fed minutes. And suddenly, the market wakes up because they noticed in the minutes that they actually talked about taper in December. So we've seen the rally in the dollar. The dollar made new highs. Uh, equity sold off. Uh, yen crosses or risk effects was under pressure. So the market really started to take the taper on board, suddenly really, you know, getting the memo that actually taper is coming. Now, on the negative side, if you look forward to uh, Friday, that suddenly has downgraded the expectations for uh, Jackson Hole. So the market suddenly thinks like, you know what, uh, Powell is not going to rock the boat. We kind of know now taper is kind of incoming. So, you know, we, we probably talk about next time we talk about it is before the federal uh, meeting on September 22. So the market has priced out any expectations that we get any surprises on Friday. Now, personally, I think this is a great opportunity in terms of asymmetric, asymmetric risk. So you can actually just, we had a nice little sell-off in the dollar, risk effects bounce, equities bounce. So really we are now sort of probably very neutral price going into, into Friday. So that right. means... Uh, I'm going to be long dollars. I bought dollars into this deep against actually almost everything. Uh, and I'm going to go long dollars into the meeting. Why? Because, A, like I said, it's asymmetric risk, meaning if it's nothing, we price for nothing. So really, I don't think the market is going to go crazy selling the dollar because they know in September it's going to be taper anyway. So I think the downside is a bit limited. On the top side, I think if... Powell wants to send a signal that actually taper could happen as early as November, as Goldman is now calling for, or they sort of shifted the risk to November from December. Then he has to kind of up the ante on Friday, meaning sending a very strong signal. So for me, there's really the surprises on the hawkish side now, given we have sort of priced in uh, or sort of priced out any expectation. The only downside, which I'm a little bit disappointed, is that this sort of in-person meeting has been canned and it's now a one-day virtual event. Yes. Uh, it's always a shame because I think Jackson Hole is a great platform for the central bank. We have these sort of in corridor chats and, you know, off the record chats. And, you know, later on you hear a bit stuff, right? So it's really exciting. And, and, and to have gone vir virtual in the last minute is a bit of a shame. So that may actually have added for the market just to expect less. So and, uh, yeah, maybe and, it is nothing. Uh, but I think the, the, like I said, the risk the risk would be to the upside. So it's probably okay to be long dollars into the meeting. The only other thing I would say is Powell has been a little bit under pressure from some uh, areas of the Democratic Party that started to sort of demand the end of, of QE. Uh, there is, uh, Biden said after the Labor Day holiday is going to announce the success or the you know nomination of the new Fed chair. Um, so maybe as a cynical trader, I would say, Maybe he has to up the ante in order to actually keep his job. I know yeah. it's a bit, <laughs> you know, it's a bit cynical. But um, I think the only other thing is Yellen has sort of uh, gave him a lot of sort of uh, backing to be renominated. So I think Yellen's word is probably quite strong in the Biden administration. So I think it should be all right. But you know what? Powell has to probably shift gear. I look at some of the charts on inflation. Uh, prices paid, the, the sort of the whole sort of uh, weight pressure that's building. I really do think the Fed should buy insurance and, and should go just aggressive because, come on, do we need 120 billion a month? No, we don't. Right. So then it's a question for towards September what we're going to price, how big taper is going to be, when it's going to start. But that's not for now that we can discuss uh, early in September. 
Well, the other thing, oh, in, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, the other thing, uh, you know, about the UK and Sterling, that may be something that is, is could be interesting for you guys in the US that maybe not as close to what's going on in the UK. Um, obviously, we have Brexit, as you all know. Uh, then we had COVID. So like two just century events really hitting at once. And a lot of the issues we had since Brexit or COVID has been sort of masked by COVID. So the government could just always blame everything with COVID. And like we had a quick chat before we went on, on air uh, about you know the supply issues we have in the UK that have nothing to do with COVID. Just as an anecdote, uh, we have 1,250 McDonald branches in the UK. They don't have any milkshakes or bottled uh, drinks. <laughs> <Right>. Panic. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, no milkshakes. Yeah. So this is just an anecdote. You know, there were Nando's running out of chicken and stuff like that. And this is not, not uh, COVID. This is Brexit. We are short. We are 100,000 lorry drivers short since Brexit. These are Europeans that used to be here that went home. Post uh, you know, during COVID, and now I have a problem to come back due to Brexit. So we have supply issues that are not the same supply chain issues we talk about at the global market. We talk about straight, real supply issues that we even have empty shelves in supermarkets at times. So this is not a developed market economy sort of headline you would expect. So yeah. I just noticed in the last two weeks, Sterling has started to underperform. After it has outperformed the first six, seven months of the year, thanks to this great job we did on vaccinations and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and now there are cracks forming. Now Brexit, as we go into the reopening after COVID, we now start to actually see the true cracks of Brexit, stuff the government doesn't want you to see, basically. But this is just stuff that is going to be a drag on growth. But I think the sort of outperformance of sterling could actually shift to on the performance for the rest of the year. And, you know, we were, as you mentioned, we were talking um, before uh, this, before we started this video, you know, you're right. The sterling has been underperforming. You, you really see it in, you know, you might not see it so much against the dollar. You know, everybody looks at the sterling, you know, or, you know, they're looking at the cable, but, but really you look at the, the, the sterling against other currencies and cross rates like the euro sterling looks like it's found some pretty pretty strong support around the 85 pence level. Yeah, and especially if you think that the euro itself is not very big, right? So that makes it even more interesting that euro sterling is looking, I totally agree with you, actually yeah. looks a bit big. Uh, sterling yen is another one. That was a huge trade in the recovery, March 2020 low to like the highs of this year. Uh, can't remember, 25, 28% rally of the, low, of the lows. Probably one of the best performing yen crosses out there. Uh, and that started to underperform as well. And if you really were to roll over, I think cable has a lot of downside. If the dollar really participates here, we have sterling yen. It probably has quite a lot of room on the downside too. So there's just a few axes in sterling that uh, are becoming a little bit of a problem. That's interesting. Um, now, you, you'd mentioned, you, and I, I want to make sure I reiterate this so people at home listening in. Um, understand exactly what you're saying. I mean, you know, some of these supply issues that you're seeing in the UK, they are not related to, you know, the closures of ports in China. This is not a global issue. This is more of a localized issue. And so the sterling should be on everybody's radar. To be honest, this is a UK only issue. But yeah. the, the, the topic you just mentioned is just an add on. I yeah. mean, we obviously have the same problem as the global story, the, you know, the, the China port story or whatever you want to call it. Right. But we, on top of it, we have these local supply issues, which is just a, a drag uh, on growth. Uh, there is already less production going on uh, in some of the goods because, you know, especially in the run up to Christmas, you know, I know mentioning Christmas in August is crazy, but this is the trade is obviously already preparing for the next, next big event, which is Christmas. Right. So they are they are already cutting production of many sort of things because they know there'd be an issue to actually supply it. So even if we were to solve the problem, which I don't think we will in the short term, but even if we would, the drag on the economy on growth is already here because there's already a reduction on productivity in certain areas of, of the economy because they know they can't supply the goods. 
So the damage, I'm not talking about huge damage at this point, but if you just talk, you know, there's such a fine line in the market right now between hawkish central banks, starvish central banks, taper, no taper, better grow, slower grow. You know, there's such a fine margin as we sort of almost reset the world in 2020, right? Everyone going to zero, everyone going to QE. Now yeah. it's really, everything is very fine margins. And on these sort of fine margins, if you have to look for a trade, you have a Fed that would, as I expect, taper aggressively at some point. That's a dollar story. If you then start to look like, okay, I want to buy a dollar against what do I buy? You start to pick those that you feel like, you know what? On the margin, they have like a few negative things going on. And Sterling is definitely one of them. Well, Beat, I want to say thank you so much for your input, especially ahead of Jackson Hole. And I'm, I agree with you, you know, Jackson Hole for... For, for so many years, for us as traders, we love having those side conversations, getting the headlines periodically, sporadically, and going online, you know, I don't know what there is to really look forward to other than the, the chairman's speech. So it's unfortunate for all of us, but, you know, I think you got us well prepared for, for this week. Thanks very much. Be, we'll look forward to speaking with you soon. And guys and gals, if you like hearing from uh, Beat and the macro Beat, if you will, make sure you click his link down in the bio so you can get more information from him. He's a, he's a regular contributor here at Trader Summit. I love talking with you and I love talking macro with you. Um, thanks for joining us today. Thanks you very much for having me, Blake. Have All a right. lovely day. Bye-bye. You do the same. Good luck.